please help me welcome Tim Scher. Hello, everybody. It's Tim Scher here. Thanks so much for being a part of our program. We have an amazing guest today, Peter Dunn. Pete the Planner is in the house. Cision said that uh, Pete was the fourth most influential financial talk show host and planner in the country. And I've spent some time with him. I've had the pleasure of being on stage with him. And uh, it's absolutely true. And so um, let me tell you real quick about Pete, and then we're going to get right in like we always do. So um, if you've been watching uh, or read in USA Today, if you've watched Good Morning America, if you've listened to uh, the radio lately, if you've been on YouTube or anywhere on social media, you've probably seen Pete the Planner. He is out there helping people to, China, uh, to change and improve their financial future. And so, and he's a really great guy. I met him actually, he was emceeing for a big conference and just because he's funny. So get this, numbers and funny, what, right? And so Pete, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. And I, I, the last time you and I were together, I was introducing you, and now you're introducing me. So it, yes, it I like it. I know. I wish we had some theme music, you know, and the lights and show. And so <laughs> I'll have to add that in. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, Pete, I know how busy you are. I really appreciate you taking time to uh, be with us here today. So, this program is for people who are hungry to learn and grow. It's usually sure. business professionals, entrepreneurs, self employed people that are trying to make it happen. And one of the main reasons why, besides adding value, is we want to know how to make more money, how to be financially free. And that's why when I thought about having someone on the show that could help us with that, you were the, my first choice. So are there, is there any advice that you would give someone, maybe a bit or two of advice? Let's say it this way. If you could only give one or two bits of advice to somebody that would really make a difference for them financially, what might it be? I always start with make tomorrow easier. You know, I think a, a lot of times when we're in business, whether we're dealing with uh, sort of how our careers flow or our financial lives, too often we're distracted by getting satisfaction and pleasure now. Yeah. And, and when that happens, you compromise your future. And, and I think just on the most elementary level, every time you go to the mall and you buy something on a whim, you've just chosen now over later. And while that is a popular candy, or I guess was a popular candy, not a really good financial technique. And uh, so, so even, even in my own financial life, I, I have to tell myself, Tim, on a pretty regular basis, um, we have it printed all over offices, the, the phrase make tomorrow easier, because mm -hmm. That's what it's about. It's about doing yourself a favor later. I, I know I look back, the younger me had more hair. Maybe both of us had more hair, right? We, <laughs> me, the younger me, and I think, uh, man, sometimes I really didn't do myself too much of a favor right now. I'm kind of mad at that guy. I almost feel like I should take all the money I have and build a time machine and go back and punch the other guy in the face because <laughs> I, I, I didn't do myself some favors in some certain areas, and so I'm committed to doing that going forward. So that's number one. It's good. Good advice. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, I think that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, number two on, on top of that is, uh, it, sure, hard work is important, uh, but I think sometimes we can get lost in hard work and we can say, well, I'm working hard. Why isn't it happening for me? Uh, but I, I think it's because we're not setting goals around that. Uh, you can work hard. If, if I just like leave the house and I'm going on a hard walk, if I don't know where I'm going, how do I know if it was what I wanted? You know, that sort of classic thing. So yeah, I yeah that's, to struggle with that. That's a common one. And, and cause you'll have people, uh, you know, we both talk to people all the time that will say, well, I've set goals and you know, every year I set these goals and then every year I'm setting the same goal. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, uh, I stopped setting goals because I was tired of not hitting, <clears throat> of not hitting them. Right. And so, um, uh, it's challenging though. And so, just for a moment, you know, everybody knows you because you're a celebrity and, and things like that, but um, what's something that people might not know about you that you have worked, that maybe you've struggled with? Because we talk about the successes and the breakthroughs and we give the great advice and they, you know, you've got 4 million readers that read your column, you know, every week. And so, you know, they see that, but what are some of the challenges that you've had and how did you overcome them? Yeah, a couple things. Number one is I started in the financial services industry, and I guess I still am in the financial services industry, but I was a financial planner. I'd help people on an individual basis, one-on-one, -on -one, help their financial lives. And 
I think one of the biggest challenges early for me is that I had a spirit of wanting to help people. And, and a lot of people in the industry say that. I mean, and, and a lot of people in your industry, uh, hopefully, right, say that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but unfortunately, and, and I think you know this too, because we've talked about it, sometimes our industries aren't, don't have the structure to really allow us to help people the way we want to help them. And, and, and that is to say in the financial world, financial world is built to help people with money. It is not to, build, to help people without money. Right. So one of the biggest challenges was, is for me to say, um, and I think every financial advisor runs up against this. They have to say, okay, I want to help people. But am I going to put an ellipses on the back of that? Am I only going to say, I want to help people who have money? And so the big challenge for me was to get rid of the ellipses and just say, look, man, I got one dot at the end and it's, I want to help people. And so that caused me to get out of the financial industry um, and, and create what we've created now, which is a resource to answer questions for people who don't have money. I mean, we answer questions every day for people who have money too. But my goal is not to make people richer. It's, a, it's to help people uh, gain stability and uh, put their kid through college and it'll be the first person in their family to go to college. And uh, I'm not here to pick great investments. I don't care about that. That's why I stopped doing that because I just found it to be ridiculous. And uh, so that was an early struggle because Tim, it took years, years to create a model uh, that is sustainable where I can have employees and I can accomplish my own financial goals. Um, just so much. So now, I mean, you know, as, as we have this conversation, um, you know, we're about to double in size in the next year as an organization because we've really got our finger on the pulse of how to help people who don't have money and, and how to make a business out of it. Yeah. You know, that's really, really powerful. And it's, and I think if our listeners really, pay attention to what you just said or the people that are watching this on YouTube or wherever, you switched. You switched from, you know, how do I make a bunch of money to how do I add as much value as possible? And you're not going after the people who are high value clients, right? You're looking for the average person who's, who's needs some help, who doesn't have that financial guidance, you know, who doesn't, um, you know, maybe they didn't grow up wealthy and they just came from, you know, working class people and, and, uh, and they just didn't get that education growing up. And you really don't get the education unless you seek it out. And, uh, and then there's so many people that are willing to, uh, you know, rob you that who, then who do you trust, right? So then you have someone like you who comes along and says, hey, I want to just make sure you have security, stability, get your kid through school, you know, be able to retire, not have to live off the government. You know, these, you know, be prepared in case something happens with your health. These are all realistic things. And, um, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of financial planners and advisors and, you know, done the conferences and stuff. And you don't hear people talk like that, that much, <laughs> you know, they really are looking for those whale clients who are going to set them up. And, uh, and I think that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. And I, I would say, I, I feel tempted. I mean, just in this moment of sort of clarity to say, well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to do it the way those other folks want to do it. But sure. well, being honest, kind of is. That's why I'm doing it differently. Because I, I, think, I think that it is. I yeah. think that's why you have to add the ellipses. Like yeah. if you say, I want to help people, but you really only want to help people with money. I think you have to say, I want to help people with money. I think you have to say that. Otherwise, yeah. I don't think you'll ever be the best version of you because you're living in this dream world where you're not going to help people that don't have money. So I just say I, I help people with money and it works for me. Well, I think that's great. I've walked on both sides. Yeah. So I started out broke. So I focused on helping broke people, which yeah. means I didn't charge very much. And I was a fantastic practitioner that was totally broke. <laughs> and then I thought, you know, after a while I got really good and I trained a bunch of people and I thought, all right, you guys take care of the people that are struggling. I'm going to go after the high value clients. And so, and I was very clear about it. I charge a lot more because, you know, I've got the chops to do it and I can get you the results. And I just charge more money and they paid more money and it was all whatever it is that, that you're focusing on, right? Or what you believe about yourself. And so as long as you're clear on what your intentions are, and usually if you're clear on your intentions, other people will be cool with that. It's when you say one thing and do something else, that's when it throws it off. Yeah, I think people also struggle to define what it is to be financially successful. Mm -hmm. You know, I think our natural inclination is to say, well, it's a person that has a lot of money and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. 
and I, in, in my late twenties, I, I just turned 40 here recently, but in my late twenties, there was just this sort of reckoning where I had to say, you know, money for me is uh, financial success for me is to not have financial obligations. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's the, it's the old, instead of ha- wanting to have a lot of money, I want to get to a point, Tim, where I don't need a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so I think that is actually the solution for middle America is, is how do we get people to retire in the midst of a retirement crisis? I think it's that we work on our consumption habits and we get people to a point where they're not addicted and so dependent on their income that they can never stop working. And uh, that's why I say make tomorrow easier because that's what this is about. I, I, I'm not solely focused on retirement, but I am focused on not today. So if we can mm-hmm. define the future as not today, that's what I'm focused on. Yeah, and um, would you say that that's 100% not today? or most of the time, not today? Look, I mean, I, I, I budget in a very lazy way. And here's how I personally budget. And I'll tell anybody this, this is what I do. I, um, <laughs> I max out all my goals. That's the very first thing that happens. I max out my 401k, max out my kids' college fund, max out my HSA, mm-hmm. or we have a full emergency fund mm-hmm. already. So then I'll spend whatever I want because I don't care because I've already taken care of my goals. What I used to do is at the end of the month, I'd sweep over what was left mm-hmm. and uh, it was what it was. But now I'm, I'm lazy that way. I'm like, well, let's just take care of business. Let's get up at 530 and do your workout so I don't have to convince myself to do my workout at 830 at night when everyone's getting ready for bed because I didn't do it at 530. And, and that's where I'm just mentally right now as a business owner and as a human, I'm in this mood of like, let's just get it done and then do whatever the heck you want. That's where I'm at. Yes, yes. And anyway, that's awesome. Any way that uh, you can automate it too, right? So that it is something that can happen automatically and then don't wait for it. You know, these are all little things I've picked up from you over the years. You know, if you can only um, invest a dollar, you know, invest that dollar, you know, yeah. into that fund or that write off or whatever it is. So you're paying yourself first instead of with whatever's last, you're left over. Because usually uh, for a lot of people, there isn't anything left over. So, Got to be strategic with it. Yeah, I think what, what people get confused about is when you, when you have a financial goal and $10 comes into your life, mm-hmm. you wait for $1,000 to come into your life to, to fund that goal. But mm-hmm. the, the whole point of a goal is to inform your next extra dollar. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if I, you normally make $350 a week and I have a goal, but this week I make $351, the goal is so I know what to do with the dollar right? The goal isn't so that, oh, I get a tax refund so that now I can save a thousand dollars towards that goal. No, it's to inform your next extra dollar. And I think um, it, we live in a world of excess, uh, especially as Americans, where um, we watch shows and we read magazines that show us other people's lifestyles and those are the ones we want. And so we take our extra dollars to increase our lifestyle now um, and then we never reach our goals because all the fuel that would have, have been there for us has gone to increase our lifestyles. I don't know if you Lucid, are you trying to give me a stroke here. So this, this is world's greatest vacations. I know it says it backwards on here, but world's greatest vacations, right? These marketing pieces, this just came in the mail today. And that's exactly right. It's, t- I mean, look at one of the pictures is, you know, a helicopter landing on a boat. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right? It's ridiculous. It is, but it gets into our psychology and then it makes us think that we have to have all these things. And yeah. then we get addicted to these things. And then when you try to get rid of them, so I got the cable and then I had the cable with the recorder box, a DVR in each room. So we've got like four of these boxes, you know, and then we had to all of a sudden have Netflix and then we had to have Hulu. And then we had to have HBO because there is a show on each one. And then I go to cancel one of them or get rid of one of the recorder boxes. And it's like, no, we can't do that, though. We haven't finished it. We haven't done that. And it's at 10 bucks a month, 15 bucks a month, three ninety nine. dollars Because then if I can't find something, I'll rent it. So on top of all of that TV, then I'll spend four bucks or five bucks if I wanted in HD or seven if I wanted in 3D, right? Yeah. And it just keeps keeps um, nickel and diamond away. And it's so easy, even if you make more money, because everybody thinks that people that I know, it's just, well, the solution is make more money. 
but then you just keep spending more and you find yourself broke at a higher level. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is more dangerous. Like I, I find there's this group of people who, and if we can quantify it here, I, I would say with a household income or no, an individual income of $100,000 to $400,000 a year. I think that's the danger zone because not only do you get so much rope to hang yourself with, but it, you can get yourself in a jam that you cannot get out of because you have so much debt. I, I had an, a partner for a law firm come to me back when I did this stuff, right? A few years ago and said, hey man, I make 400,000 a year. I have $300,000 in credit card debt. Oh, um, what do I do? And I'm like, build the time machine, man, because, because, because we're in trouble. Um, but, but that's the thing. It's like, if you have that much disposable income, you'll dispose of it and it won't be pretty. And, and that's why I like the idea that funding your goals first. And, and I, it's so cliche, Tim, and you know that, and I know that, but um, it works. So why, why buck the system? Everyone likes to have an app and, oh, I go to this site to, to manage my money. And that's all great, but it's simpler than that. It, it's really just structuring your goals, funding them first, and then blowing your money on whatever you want after that. Maybe I can get on that helicopter because I've already funded my stuff. But if I got on the helicopter before I funded my stuff, I'm a jerk. Yeah, you're flying around in a helicopter, one broke SOB. <laughs> yeah, well, it's smart. And then, of course, it comes down to people saying, well, I don't have any willpower or I married to somebody and they don't have the same mindset or values. And there's always some obstacle. And sometimes these excuses, you know, are, are real. You can appreciate it, right? Yep. The fact that you might be in those situations. But still, so... What advice do you give? Because I'm sure you see people that tell you that all the time. So is there any bit of advice that you share with them besides, you know, suck it up? <laughs> well, uh, so financial health and, and fitness mm -hmm. are the same thing. Okay. So if you think about your financial health, your financial behaviors, financial habits, and then how fit you are and what your nutrition is, same thing, same mm -hmm. mechanism, same behavior, same thing. So Tim, yeah. I, I've struggled staying healthy to how I, to, to the level of health I'd like to have, uh, cause I'm on the road a lot, you know, you and I, we, we did a little bit of a, a traveling circus together last year and, um, yeah. I'm on the road a lot. Yeah. And so my, my comfort after a long hard day used to be to get to my airport, wherever I was heading, grab a beer and grab a burger, go yeah. on my flight, get to the next city and fall asleep. Well, here's where I'm at now, man. I've been off the road for a couple months. I've, uh, committed to not doing that. So yeah. I wanted to lose like 25 pounds like that. Well, that doesn't really work. Like it's like, oh, hey, I want to get financially healthy. So let's do it right now. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't, it does actually doesn't work that way. You have to fight through the first couple weeks of behavior change, which are horrific. Um, you don't see the feedback you want. Yeah. And everyone, you know, even when they read my books or take my courses and people are like, oh, well, it'll all be better in two weeks. No, it won't, man. It's going to suck for two weeks because that's the whole part of it. My cravings are going nuts. Your cravings financially are going nuts. You get a little adversity and you quit. Um, and so, me. I'm no, allergic to thinking about all of that. <laughs> no, so this is where I'm at now. I'm 38 days in a row I have exercised for wow. 40 minutes in a day. Outstanding. That's and, really good. And now, like I went to dinner at a steakhouse with a friend last night. We hadn't seen uh -huh. each other in a while. I ordered a, a grilled chicken salad. <laughs> at a steakhouse. <laughs> day, day one or two, not happening. Day 38, right. yeah, I'm in. Like, and so with people's financial lives, the challenge is they're like, okay, I'll change. New Year's resolution, let's do it. I'm ready to go. Okay, I can, uh, three days, four days of effort, not seeing any feedback. This is hard. Yeah. Uh, not worth it. And they just missed the hump. Like they were just almost over the hump and yeah. they fail. Yeah. And uh, if you're doing it alone, like if you don't have an accountability partner, if your significant other is completely off the, the reservation, then, uh -huh. then it's, a, it's exceptionally hard, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's still possible. And you're proof of it, right? And you're exactly right. What we do is we associate pain to whatever it is that we're doing. And then our brain immediately pushes away from it and it says, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. And that's when we go order the big greasy steak or whatever it might be. So it's because, um, you know, so 
If people aren't seeing the results right away, they have to create the results in their mind by jumping to the end, right? Jumping to the end of, of whatever it is that they're trying to get to. And that will help them to feel more motivated because they're reminding themselves of why they're doing this. And then by thinking about the end result, it'll create that feeling of um, confidence or security or it will remind them that this is the right thing to do. And it'll give them that emotional oomph to be able to get where they want to be. You know, you've heard that before. Triumph is a little bit of try and a whole lot of oomph, you know, and, and by focusing your mind on the outcome and associating pleasure intentionally to whatever it is that you need to do. And if you keep doing that, then, you know, it'll get easier, like you're saying. And researchers have said that if you do something 60 days in a row, 61 was the actual number. If you do it 61 days in a row, it carves that neural pathway in your brain and transforms it into an automatic habit. Something you don't have to think about anymore. It just becomes you. And that's so if you can think about doing it that way, um, and then you keep your eyes on that, on that mile marker. Now, 61 days might seem like a lot, but boy, the months fly by. And if you can keep your eyes on that prize, then it will get you to that place where it's so much easier. You know, I was at a point this morning where I was actually writing my goals for, for the next year, right? And um, it's always an exciting day. You know, it's meant more to me as I've, I've progressed in my career. So professional goals, personal goals. And I, I do a method in which I brainstorm them out. Mm -hmm. Then I narrow it down to the three most important in each one. Mm -hmm. And then I narrow it down to the most important in each one. Mm. I got to a place where my personal goal for the next year is to have a 30 minute workout every single day, mm. every single day, three. And so look, Tim, I'm going to win or I'm going to lose. There's no manby pamby. Like there's no, well, you could do okay. No, it doesn't matter, dude. If I'm off right. the reservation on day two, I've lost. Yeah. So, yeah. um, what I think I'm enjoying and what I think people enjoy about their financial life when they figure this out is control. Like, what is it to be in control? Like when you have money, we're holding money and you, and you, it's a gift card, let's say, and you can go to your favorite store. You think you're in control. Oh, I got this money. I'm in my favorite store. This is perfect for me. I'm in control. That's not in control. <laughs> in control is this idea where, you're calm, you're, you're breathing this level, it, whatever level of money you have doesn't matter to you. You're just like this. And, and you can have a good day at work financially and you don't care. And it's not that you don't celebrate your victories. And you're not living in the now. It's just that your goals are an afterthought in a good way, right? You're like, I'm just on a, on a mission to get those done. And so I, I'm, I love this stuff. I talk about this stuff all day long because where some people struggle financially, I look at other areas of my life. I do fine financially because I just happen to, to put the right habits in place. It's not because I make a ton of money. It's because I, I put the right things in place. But with the other areas of my life, relationships, spiritually, my health, like I have to try to harness what I know about money and create those pathways. And if you're watching this now and your listeners and, and viewers, uh, and you have a great area of your life that you love and you're in control, like I'm in control of my relationship. Fantastic. Let's harness what works there with your financial life because it's those skills that, that are going to allow it to happen because you know what it is to truly be in control. And Tim, for those folks that have never been in control, maybe for those people that were not born or raised in a circumstance that allowed them to have any semblance of control, first of all, it's incredibly sad and real. Uh, mm -hmm. Number two, all you and I want are, are for people to experience that control so they can take, take control of their career and their money and their life. Yes. Yes, absolutely. People are walking around with such power inside. And if you've never been told that, if you don't, don't know it, even if you disbelieve it, it doesn't matter. The power is still inside of you. And learning how to tap into that power and channeling it into your relationships, your financial health, your uh, physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health, um, that's what it's all about. And so, uh, yeah, I think that it's really important, the uh, idea of what we're all re really looking for in so many ways is to just feel at peace. You know, I call it inner pieces because you don't, you know, you get a piece of it here and you get a piece of it there. And sometimes people think, well, I have to be 100% connected with my relationship to have total peace or I have to have, you know, $100,000 in the bank to have peace or, you know, or whatever it might be for somebody. You know, maybe for somebody it might be $500 and I would have some peace uh, in life. 
but really it's creating that peace and learning how to go within and, and you've got to go get help with this. You know, I spent years at the library learning and then I hired coaches, you know, when I could afford it, I would hire coaches. I hired coaches when I couldn't afford it because I wanted to get the results faster. And, um, uh, you know, you got to get the education. And I think that's why you and I both work so hard to be able to provide people, uh, you know, different levels of education and different ways to get it so that there's no excuses. We both have stuff that if you got no money, we can still help you, right? Yeah. We, we still got tools and resources wherever you're at that will start to build you up. I got to tell you this story real quick. So, um, so I was traveling around doing these uh, weekend seminars for this guy, I don't even know, like 15 years ago. And um, he was a really old school salesman, right? And kind of got in front of the audience and was just my way or the highway, you know, a real driver. And, uh, but I remember we were having this dinner at this hotel and, uh, and he said, now let me tell you, see, he was from the South. So he go, now let me see here, Tim, see here. So when, when you have a winner, see, when everybody shows up, he says, you go to Red Lobster. You know, I mean, no, he didn't say red laps. He says, he says, when you have a winner, he says, you go to McDonald's. He says, and when you have a loser, you go to Red Lobster. He says, because whatever happens in the room does not affect your attitude. You decide your attitude. You know, and I thought, now those are words of wisdom, right? Because, you know, sometimes you're going to be doing great and sometimes you're going to be having a hard time. But if you can maintain your focus and that peace all the way through and just stick to the goals that you set for yourself and work the plan that you have then those you know, rainy days are gonna go away and the sun's gonna come back out. You know, I, I have a small version of that. On, on my worst days of my career, I, 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 let me back up a second. A long time ago, my grandpa told me never to drink to celebrate or drink to commiserate. He said that's a bad thing to do. Now, I don't know if I agree with that. However, <laughs> I break his rules for this reason. On my worst days, I mean, truly like five worst days of my career, I've made it purposefully, uh, I, I purposefully celebrated the day with a bottle of champagne at the end of it. Because to me, if you can take your worst day and you can celebrate it and see whatever good is in it, then you can't lose. Hmm, I love because that. Because it's, it's like, and the first time I did that, I felt goofy and it's weird. And, and I did it and I was like, I felt so good afterwards, not because I had a half a bottle of champagne in me, but because you're in control. That's what we want. You know, when we say things like, well, I deserve the best or only the best for me, that we misunderstand what that means. That doesn't mean only the best car for me or only the best lobster for me or only the best champagne for me. It means what is best for me as, an, as a person to stay in control. Uh, and if you, if you misconstrue that or misunderstand it or misdiagnose it, here's what ends up happening. You begin to tolerate what you should not tolerate. Mm. Um, if you're struggling financially, it's likely it's because you're tolerating your situation, right? You, you, you've learned to push down the elements of stress that say, Tim, stop doing that. Stop doing that. You've repressed them. You've tolerated the signs that something is wrong. I went to my doctor that caused this whole health of revival here in the fall. And he, I wanted some acid reflux medication. I'm 40. I, I was like, Hey, I'm in heartburn. He's like, here's the thing, Pete, I will not give you heartburn medication because that is an indication that you're putting something in your body that you shouldn't. And if I give you heartburn medication, you will get fatter and fatter and fatter because every day you will take a get out of jail free card and you will do whatever you want. Wow. So no, I'm not giving you one. And, and Tim, I think that's what we do with our financial lives. We tolerate right now. If you're not prepared for retirement, you're tolerating that. Yeah. If you're in debt, you're tolerating that. Mm -hmm. If you don't give to your community and with your time or your money, you're tolerating that. And, and I think the longer we do it, the, it, it becomes this addiction. You're addicted to this tolerance that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, and so, and again, I, I'm not preaching to anybody else other than myself. Like the good thing about this interview, I can see myself. I can actually see an image of myself. I'm saying this to me for the other areas of my life. Like if I want to tolerate the garbage that I put up with, it's only going to hurt me. That's why I need to stop tolerating the obvious signs that I need to change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely right. So, you know, it's really funny. Uh, I love how you said uh, celebrate on your worst day. Yes. Why not? That's really, yeah, that's really a great uh, pattern interrupt, right? To reframe it because we get, 
the only reason it feels like the worst day is because that's what we're telling ourselves it is. And, uh, you know, it's not just the situations, it's the meaning that we give to them and how we interpret them. And, and so we have the ability to be able to change the way we're feeling based on what we're telling ourselves and what we're focusing on. And, and so doing something like that, you know, it's really uh, effective. So yeah, yeah I, it's that not too high, not too low. It's only yeah. a bad day if you label it a bad day. I, I've even gone so far as on a great day. I don't acknowledge it, like not because I'm not living in the present. Like I, if I like if we get a big deal for a big licensing deal for organization, like I, I won't go home and like tell my wife about it. Not because she doesn't want to know, which she probably doesn't particularly care, but that's OK. Um, but it's because what's it matter? I'm in control, yeah. so I shouldn't be so high by that. And again, some people are here this and think, well, man, that guy never lives in the now. He never celebrates what's going on. It's like, well, the way I work is I got to just stay like this. I got to stay in control. Yeah, it really is about. So control means learning how to make the right decisions or smart decisions that are going to help you now and in the future. And it creates, it cultivates a feeling of peace inside. Right. And yeah. so if somebody says, oh, you're not really living. Well, take a look at who's saying that to you and what is their life like, <laughs> right? And if it's a whole bunch of ups and downs, you know, I've learned and I'm sure you've learned this too. I don't take advice on how to have money from people that are broke and I don't take advice on how to be happy from people that aren't, right? And so a lot of times the people that are judging, you know, are not trying to understand uh, aren't the people that we want to be taking advice from anyway. You know, when we struggle financially, it's because we don't want to say no. We want to say yes. So, you know, we're, we're predisposed to want to say yes. We don't know is such a negative thing by its nature. So, and this is weird, but personally, when I'm trying to make a decision that's a behavior based, right? When, when, it, when I'm trying to, to learn a new behavior that isn't natural and I don't want to say no to the pleasure, what I choose to do is to say yes to control, mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, at the steakhouse last night, yeah, I wanted a filet smothered in Bernays with some nice fries and some bread and some, but I mean, right. That's what I wanted. And so I wanted, I, but I, and I didn't want to say no to that. So I chose right, right. to say yes to being in control. And I'll be honest, the second the salad came, I was fine. I yeah. wasn't kind of disappointed now. It's, it's that moment of when you're saying, no, I can't have what I'm used to or no, this pleasure, which I love. No, I mean, and, and so yes to control is a great way to fix that. Well, and what else did you say yes to? You said yes to something that tasted delicious. You said yes to having energy after the meal. You said yes to feeling proud of yourself afterwards for making a good decision. You said yes to moving closer to your goal, yep. right? Those are all the things you said yes to. And we forget about that. If all we're focused on is, oh, I'm being deprived, you're sabotaging yourself. So... I like how you talked about um, the ups and downs. I got to tell you this story real quick. So there's this farmer and he has these horses and uh, they're all roped in with this fence. And one day he hears a ruckus and he goes outside and part of the fence had been broken down and some of his best stallions had run away and his neighbor was there and he's like, oh, that's too bad. And the wise farmer says, well, how do you know? Right. That afternoon, the horses come back and they've got all these wild mares with them. And now he's got twice the horses. And that neighbor happens to be there and he's like, oh, that's good. And the farmer says, well, how do you know? You know, so the next day, the farmer's son's trying to tame one of these wild mares and it bucks him, she bucks him off and he falls on the ground, breaks his leg. You know, and the neighbor's there. I don't know why the neighbor's always there, but he's there, <laughs> you know, and he, and he says, oh, that's bad. And the farmer says, how do you know? Right. The next, um, next week, the army's coming through town and they're drafting all these kids to go to this battle and his kid can't go. He's got a broken leg. Hey, that's great. How do you know? Instead of getting caught up in, instead of in all those highs and lows, you know, if we could step back and say, well, you know, I'm not going to get caught up in this. I'm going to have my discipline. I'm going to stick to my plan. I'm going to say no to the things that are going to, even if they seem enticing, you know, shiny things aren't always good to go after. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then stick to my plan. And I think that what you said about having a plan is really important because I think a lot of people are just winging it. Yeah, and there's another side to that. Um, so what you and I have been talking about this entire time is, is a form of personal responsibility with our actions, right? What yeah. What haven't necessarily, or I haven't addressed, you just did, is when something happens to you. Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. react? Like if you apply for a mortgage for your first home and the bank rejects you, mm -hmm. 
that's the best moment of your financial life. You mm. just learn what you need to do to accomplish your goal. You oh, know? that's awesome. They fight through that. They fight yeah. for the yes. They go to a different bank. And meanwhile, the first bank just told you everything you need to know. Yeah. And so um, I just think sometimes when we feel like bad things happen to us financially, if we can get through the shock of the pain of what's going on, it, it gives us a chance to figure out where that control point is and, and like how to solve that problem ultimately. And I think, um, I, I mean, I personally have learned from that financially, like where you think things are okay or, you know, being a business owner where maybe you have a really good few months after a couple bad months. And Tim, what do you and I say to each other when that happens? Never again will I get myself in that jam. <laughs> and what happened? We get in that jam. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. And so I don't know how many times over the years I've done that. And, and the good news is that's a lot less frequent now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've learned to understand the behaviors associated with it. Like, so here's the best way I can explain that. When you go to the restroom and there's a full roll of TP and you're yeah. going to be seated for a little bit, uh, you'll use all the TP you want. It's a full <laughs> roll of Charmin Ultra. You'll use whatever. <laughs> And, and, and you'll, you'll make five ply, you'll make necklaces, you'll throw to your cat, you don't care. But if you go in there and you're seated and then you look over and you see cardboard peeking through. Oh my God. Your behavior shifts. That is right? so funny. And then yeah. you get out of the jam yeah. and then you say never again. But guess what? <laughs> it happens again, doesn't it? <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome. What a metaphor. I mean, I'll remember that one. Yeah. So <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. You know, our pain often feels so temporary as soon as we get out of it. I'm always ama amazed by women that will have babies and it'll be like, oh, my God, you can't even imagine the pain that you go through. And then, you know, they have the baby for a little while. And then what do they say? Well, let's have another one. It wasn't so bad. Don't you remember the screaming and, the, <laughs> you know, and so we do that. And I've done that many times, and I really applaud you for being so honest and so vulnerable and, uh, and for sharing because too many experts out there are, um, you know, and gurus are all they're talking about is how I made $10 million in 30 minutes and you can do it too. And I was in my underwear and it's really easy. And if you just buy my system, and that's baloney. Yeah. You know, I've met some really amazing people, you present company included, and, uh, you know, they have struggled and had hardships and made it and lost it and questioned themselves and wondered if they were ever going to be able to do it again. And I certainly have done that many times. I've been broke way longer than I've had money yeah. and then had money and then got broke again. It's happened many, many times. I have a friend that said, I've been a millionaire six different times. <laughs> you know, I'm not currently, but I have been, you know, because of decisions that have been made. And what you're saying is if you have a plan, and you develop some discipline to work with that plan, you won't have as many spikes and you can really prepare yourself for those rainy days. And it just, you know, being practical, nothing fancy, just simple and set a plan. And then maybe people, I, I'm sure people need help with how do you create that plan? How do you get it to work? How do you develop the discipline? You know, and we both have resources that will help them with that. So there shouldn't be any excuses. Yeah, I think visualization is really important for me, and I know it is for you and in your business. Sure. But I'm, at a time when I wasn't saving enough for my daughter's college, she's eight now, and I have a five-year-old son. Mm -hmm. There was a time early on when I was just like, I was saving, but but if we're being honest, she she was either mathematically on track or she was mathematically not on track to be able to have her school funded. And yeah. and the reality was, she was mathematically not on track, so I was not funding it. And I started visualizing dropping her off on campus mm -hmm. for freshman year. Mm -hmm. and then pulling away. And I'm, a, I'm a crier. All the men in my family were criers. So I, I'm imagining myself sort of crying, looking in the rearview mirror, and driving away knowing that I've just taken to her to a place where that will leave her tens of thousands of dollars in debt. Mm. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. And I'm a very emotional person. So when I thought about that, it's like, man, that is awful. I don't, oh, by the way, that will be my reality if I don't change. Like, there's no... That's what, like, so here's what drives me nuts about people and their financial decisions. A lot of people's methodology or strategy, Tim, is for the entire world uh, to, or paradigm of the situation to shift around them. 
-hmm. as opposed for them to make the change. So a lot of people say, well, I'm not paying really funny for my kid's education, but I figure, you know, something will have to change between now and then because college is so expensive. So what that person just said is, I'm not doing anything, but everything spinning around me, that will all do something different. That's my strategy. And yeah. like, that's silly. I mean, that's really silly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to take a look inside. You know, <laughs> I'm quoting Michael Jackson, <laughs> but he said it best. If you want to, um, you know, if you want to make a change in the world, you got to start with the man or woman in the mirror. Right. And uh, well, we doing success, or something. <laughs> you need a glove. <laughs> success, happiness, you know, financial prosperity, that is all an inside job. And so let me ask you, um, so what, are, what advice are you giving now with um, Trump being in the White House and all the changes going on? I was talking to my accountant this morning and, you know, it's like December 15th, we're recording this program and, you know, December 15th and my accountant has no idea what the tax laws are going to be for two weeks from now <laughs> because of all the things that are up in the air, you know, so um, suggestions? Yeah, you know, I would say, look, I know what happens in Washington eventually affects us. I think more than anything, it affects our emotions and our psyche prior to the real effects. Mm. I've sort of gotten to this place, and I, I used to love politics as sort of a spectator sport. You know, I, I enjoyed watching election night coverage and those sorts of things. And I, whatever side I feel like I agree with, I, I like to listen to that and sometimes listen to the other side. But I just got to this point now, especially with, with ta this tax issue, is that um, we, you and me, and everybody else, on a regular basis, make so many suboptimal decisions that if we're going to place our financial future in someone else's hands alone in yeah. terms of the tax code, dude, we're missing the boat completely. Right. Uh, so just better decisions are going to make up for most people in the upper middle class from the tax code perspective. Mm -hmm. That being said, like there, there will likely be changes and, and I don't know what they are. My accountant too also I mean, doesn't know what they are. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think the frustrating part is if let's say you're someone that doesn't agree in this particular policy is you're upset or those folks are upset that people are at the high end getting big tax breaks and they're not getting bigger tax breaks in the middle. Okay, so let's say that's true. I don't know. I don't know what to believe. Let's say that's true. Who cares? How does that affect your financial life if someone else is getting a tax break? Is it fair? I don't know. Probably not. But it, it shouldn't actually affect your financial future because it's money you didn't get a tax break on anyway. So what's it matter? That's a political motivation. So um, by the way, I don't necessarily know if I agree with the tax cuts, but my own personal perspective is, if bazillionaires are getting bigger cuts than I am, why do I care? It has nothing to do with me. And so I don't know, without getting political, that's just how I feel about those situations is that we look at our politicians and, and, and tax strategy and, and fiscal policy to affect our, our personal finances when the person that affects them the most is, is the person in the mirror. Yeah, yeah. So I have a friend that was a Navy SEAL. And he says, you have a plan. And then as soon as boots hit the ground, it's plan B. Yep. Right. And you have to focus on your objective and you have to focus on the particular objective that you have within your team. There's usually a six man team and you have to, you have your mission that you have to accomplish. And if you get distracted by all the other stuff that's going on or why the other plan didn't work or how unfair it is or why it's not just, then you end up shot. You had, or, or your friend ends up shot. No matter what happens, we have to keep our head down and we've got to focus on what's going to be best for us and not get distracted by all the other distractions that are going on by, you know, if, if some other billionaire is going to have another yacht or not, that's not really going to affect me at all, right? And I can understand that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and we can go into that debate and, and, and find real, you know, value in making sure that people that are underserved you know, are taken care of. I mean, that's from a humanitarian standpoint, valid. And I don't think, you know, many people would, would argue with that. At the same time, if you're spending hours and hours arguing about politics and arguing about, 
you know, what other people have and what you don't, it's keeping you from focusing on what you can have, yeah. you know, by what you can be doing right now with your life, which is why I hate drama because it just, it seems like a waste of time. Well, this is what's happening. I, whether I like it or not, it's kind of irrelevant right now. How am I going to respond to it? Yeah. What can I do that's going to get me where I need to be? I think I, we do need to acknowledge, or I need to acknowledge, there is a line though, right? Because there, financially, there are two Americas. And it's not the mm -hmm. uber rich and everybody else. No. It's people who make above living wage and people who make below living wage. So living wage is, a, is sort of a moving calculation that's north of minimum wage, but it's essentially the minimum wage for a person who has the same number of people in uh, their household as you do mm. in the county in which you live. That's what living wage is. And it, I mean, you could be making $26 an hour, but with four kids and the other adult either isn't in your house or isn't working, and you could be what's considered at living wage. And what I'm saying, to Tim, to that particular individual, based on where, what county they live in, the chance they have to succeed financially in traditional sense, pretty slim, because they're in a different America. If you make above living wage, the world is your oyster. Maybe you're not getting the billionaire tax cuts, you don't have a private jet and you know fancy stuff, but you can survive and you can have a successful financial life. But with the widening wealth gap, what we're finding, and this is sort of where I'm committing my brain to uh, and going forward, is how do we truly affect the people who make at or below living wage? Like, how can we help them move their needle? Because yeah. as it stands now, they are surviving barely. And, and, and mm -hmm. it, it does just justice to the word surviving because they're really not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my comments about, well, what does it matter to me if billionaires are getting a tax break? That's me who's doing okay. That's not a billionaire. That doesn't apply to maybe someone who's making 14 bucks an hour and they've got three kids at home. Uh, it does affect that person because their chance of financial success is slim. It does affect them. But the same rule, I think, applies. You can get caught up in how unfair it is, or you can keep looking for a way to, sure. to find a way through it. And there's plenty of, of people who have found a way through it. It's when we get stuck in the situation of what's going on. I think that that's what keeps a lot of people stuck is they're focused on why they can't, you know, and, and why it won't happen sure. as opposed to how can it and what's possible. So many of us, and I don't know if it's just hardwired into us, but even people who are optimistic are so averse to pain, you know, that we're always trying to figure out how to hedge our bets, how to cut our losses, how to avoid getting hurt. And, um, and it keeps us from taking opportunities or looking for what's possible and then trying it out. Now, I understand if you're working 12 hours, you know, you're working three jobs and you don't have, and you're just barely surviving, it's going to be hard to, you know, go to the library and get an audio book. But you could, you could go to the library and get an audio book that's free and listen to it when you're driving back and forth or taking the bus back and forth or walking back and forth. That's what I was doing, right? And so um, there's, there's a way, and that's what I want people to know, right? And you want to give them the financial tools to figure out how can we do this? Because we can sit here and debate. It happens on radio shows across the country. What the, what the tax laws and the billionaires should be doing, okay? Or what we can do is we can focus on how can we provide the education? How can we get them tools and resources that don't cost very much or don't cost anything that they can have access to, right? What can we do? The question is always what can we do, not you know why can't we? For any level wherever you're at, whether you're broke or you're just making it or you are doing pretty good but you're trying to get better or you're doing great, right? And I think the people that are doing really well, they're asking those questions. What's possible? What can I do? They kind of expect that whatever they put their mind to, they'll probably be able to pull it off. And I think part of that mindset is um, what we've got to teach. You know, you'll notice, and I know I'm talking a lot here, but you'll notice that as we talk about helping people with their finances, we're not actually talking about what, if they should use an annuity or not, or how, how balanced their portfolio should be, and diversification and dollar cost averaging. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about emotions, mm -hmm. human emotions, and how not to get caught up in things and how to have a logical plan. 
Isn't that interesting? And I'm sure yeah. you're fully aware of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I like to think that money has nothing to do with money. Like money is about behavior. <laughs> and if funny. Uh, you have good behavior financially, whatever amount of money you have is enough. Um, again, I, I think that it's funny, the, the, the wage gap thing is interesting because I agree 100% with your comments, right? That you can still pull yourself out of a bad financial situation on the lower end of the income scale. I just think naturally the number of people who do that, those stories, oh, so they're slimmer on a level. Yeah, so low. Yep. I know. It's not fair. It's not the people experience racism, people experience um, ageism, people experience um, just where you live. You know, we're both based out of uh, Indianapolis in the Midwest and I'll have clients on the East Coast and West Coast and like, wow, you guys are pretty bright. I didn't know you had that kind of mind power there in the Midwest. And I'm like, well, gee, shucks, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, all these uh, ideas. And you're right. You don't hear a lot of uh, success stories from people who are really having a hard time. And, uh, but you know, then you'll go and you'll hear other stories about, about um, you know, people who've taken trips to the slums in India and these people have nothing and they're living in garbage, but they're smiling and they're laughing and they're happy. And you wonder how can that be, especially in this place where, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I don't have a bad day. You know, my bad days don't compare to, you know, to 99% of the world when I'm having a bad day. <laughs> my bad day is the worst day ever for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think gra that's some, you know, I, I try to work on too for myself is this the idea of gratitude of, um, you know, finding something to be grateful with uh, in, in your toughest situations. You know, uh, remember when you're a, a younger man, not to suggest you're an older man, but you know, when we are younger men, um, when things would not go our way, yeah. I mean, I just remember feeling devastated over the dumbest stuff in the world, like just the dumbest stuff that now if it happened, I wouldn't even think it was at all bad. Like I wouldn't even care. Right. But it's it, it, you were, there's so much, you put so much pressure on yourself when you're younger and then everything has to work out perfectly. And it's all because you're seeking control and you don't have it. And it's only when you, you learn to be controlled that, that you don't have to seek it as much. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think a big part of this too is maturity, right? Not only from learning from, from folks like you and, and, and getting good stuff going into your brain and not, you know, nasty talk sports radio and stuff like that that gives you negative thoughts, but um, just maturing. I'm not that different of, of what I consume in the last 10 to 15 years, but boy, have I matured in terms of how I deal with adversity and success and uh, the guidance I give others? So I guess you can't teach age, right? You can't teach age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hope that you get some wisdom from all the things that you've been through. So with that, if you could go back and go back, you, let's say you got that time machine <laughs> and you could go back and you could give that, that little boy, little Pete, you know, when he was like eight years old, some advice based on what 40 year old Pete has learned, what bit of advice would you give him? I guess I shouldn't say something like buy Bitcoin when it comes out. <laughs> um, buy Apple, that's what you tell him, right? <laughs> you know what, man? And maybe this is a, an immature view, what I'm about to say. Hmm. I have no regrets. Yeah. Not, not one. I, I wouldn't do a damn thing different. I, I just, I wouldn't because the stupidest things I've ever done are the big, biggest lessons I ever had. And had I not made those horrendous mistakes, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I had a very loving childhood, a loving um, education. I had teachers saying things like, you're going to be successful at whatever you do. Now, oh, here's nice. what I've been trying to figure out for 25 years. Were they, A, saying that to everyone? B, were they, were they lying to me so that someday I would believe it? Did they really think it? I don't know, but I was dumb enough to believe it the entire time, right? Like, and, and so, um, unfortunately, again, some people don't have that, right? So I would say if I go back to the eight-year-old me, I would say maybe just continue to believe uh, that, that you know, you'll be good at what, you, what you're passionate about and what you put your, your livelihood into because I have friends that had similar upbringings that chose not to believe that. And, and it's a pretty stark difference in, into where we are now. 
Absolutely. So no matter what age you're at, you can close your eyes and just imagine talking to that little girl or boy inside and tell them you're going to be okay, right? Because what you tell yourself, you know, whatever you think about most of the time, you move towards and your life becomes. And yeah, so and I, I think I, that's I think great. That, I think to this point, I, I think how we treat others in that regard is super important too. Mm -hmm. If I have a friend who's going through something that is awful and devastating, like being able to be the person that says, we're going to get through this. Yes, it stinks, but it's going to lessen over time and, 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 it's, just, and, and it's going to be okay. Like that's the adult version, Tim, mm -hmm. of the eight-year-old boy is, is having another a trusted adult or friend there to pick someone up. Because when you say that, then you begin to believe it yourself. So when your own adversity uh, arrives, you're already in that mindset. It's not a, oh, how do I learn to, to, to deal with the adversity? No, you've helped people deal with it. And you understand that you're going to get out of just about any jam, any jam you're in. So that's sort of how I, it manifests itself in me as an adult now. That's awesome. Yeah. So I think you're 100% agree, right? When you're focused on helping others and, you know, what you give is what you have inside. And so if you are giving that uh, security and that confidence and helping people believe in themselves and letting them know they can weather any storm, then uh, when it comes around, then that's how you're going to feel because you've been putting that out there and, and, uh, and it comes back. So yeah. that's awesome. All right. So how can people find out um, how to work with you, how to work with your company, how to get some of those free resources? Where do they start? A tremendous number of free resources at peeptheplanner.com, uh, or I guess uh, USA Today isn't free unless you've got an internet connection. You can go to usatoday.com and read my column. But really what we do is we're a financial wellness company. So uh, employers come to us. Um, we have programs that uh, we call fund financial concierge programs where mm -hmm. your employees can call us, email us, live chat, text us whenever they want and we'll just answer their questions we have nothing to sell them we we don't want to meet with them the next day we're just there it can be a 30 second phone call it can be a 30 minute phone call all we do is help people not people that dot 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 have money help people hmm. that have money questions so that's how you find us peetheplanner.com and then the services i'm talking about are called pete's money school and your money line uh, so that's what we do Pete's Money School. So I really think that you are setting the bar because I don't know of anybody else that's offering anything like that. I think that's incredible to be able to provide a service where people just can call up with no catches and ask the questions that they have and they have a place where they can go do that. People don't know where that, that's, that they can do that. And what I recommend for those that are listening, get on your social media and do a shout out you know, um, the Pete, the planner .com or, or your, what did you call it? The money line? what did you call it? Yeah. It's called your money line. It sounds like it's money a money line. Right, it but does. But I love that because what we need to do is spread that around so that more people know that that resource is available. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and get that out there and, uh, you know, there no catches or anything. Um, you know, so, um, I think that's smart because a lot of times people would use these resources if they knew they were available and they just don't know. And so the more you share that with other people, then there's someone that's in your social media that runs a non for profit foundation. I have uh, friends that I know that run all kinds of associations. I'm going to tell them about this resource in your site because they can let their friends know. They can let other people that wouldn't have access to this know. You know, we can find a phone number and give a phone number out for people that aren't on the internet, right? right? They would have no idea. I just think that's amazing. So thank you. We yeah, it's good. You're going to double your team because you're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Well, Pete, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I loved all the things that you were saying. I took lots of fun notes and uh, lots of tweetable comments here. And uh, when we get done, I'm definitely going to go and check out your site and, and check out those uh, resources that you have and start to spread the word because I think it's really valuable what you're doing. And, um, and this has been great. I appreciate how honest you are. It's straightforward. You haven't bought into your own hype. You yeah. know, you're just like, hey, I'm just a guy trying to do my best and add some value. And you did a great job. So I thank you. Uh, I thank you for being on the program today. No, it's good being with you again, Tim. Yeah, great to see you. So, all right. And for everybody that's been watching this, uh, make sure you go to PeteThePlanner.com and check out his resources again. It's for people of all income levels. So if you're out there crushing it right now, 
then you're going to get some excellent advice. So you can, you can definitely benefit. If you've got a company that um, needs some resources for your employees, Pete's an excellent place to start, right? Great resource for you. So uh, check them out. And as always, thank you so much for watching our podcast. I really appreciate uh, you being with me. If you weren't here, uh, I guess Pete and I still had a great conversation. Yeah. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah. So, but without you watching or listening, then uh, it just wouldn't be as much fun. So anyway, thanks so much. Use these tools and make your life a sure success. Thank you.